Right. Good morning. Welcome to God Manifest. Thank you for everyone who's online joining us. We're using our Mevo camera. It's brand new. We're trying to figure things out. So if it's not working well, it's not my fault. Um, all right. So it's time for our offering. So uh, how we do offerings here is we just want y'all just to ask God. We all have personal relationships with God. Ask God what to give, how much to give, and just give. Um, we believe that God has a, God, God will put ministries and things on your hearts to pour into. And, and as God does that, and you give, I believe there's an abundance of, of uh, there's an overflow of, of blessings that, that they erupt from that giving, from that obedience. Um, today, we're, I'm excited because we're celebrating Olivia's birthday. Uh, we're doing a crawfish boil after church. Um, so there are some people heading here. We've got some text messages. Some people are running a little late. Um, so we're excited that y'all are, are still heading this way. We're going to have a great time. We bought about 100 pounds of crawfish. Um, pray for me, those who are online. I've never boiled crawfish before. So um, you know, pray that I don't screw it up. So, um. <laughs> okay, so when Olivia and I, let me try to figure out if I can do this. When, I, when Olivia and I got married, 2011, October, there was a song I wanted to sing to her, and I chickened out. Um, I figured today I'm going to try to sing it to her. It's kind of funny because yesterday we were out at the pool uh, at her dad's house and she said, hey, sing me my, sing me my song. And I was like, I'm singing it tomorrow. Why am I going to sing it here at the, on the pool? So the song's called Crazy Love. The, the writer is a guy named Van Morrison. But as I sing it over her, God wanted y'all to receive it as him singing it over you because he's madly and crazy in love with you. Okay. I kind of cut off some lyrics so I can get through this before I, I break down. So I can hear your heartbeat from a thousand miles. Heavens open up every time that you smile. And when I come to you, that is where I belong. And I'm running to you like a river song. You give me love, 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 crazy love. You give me love, 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 crazy love. You have a fine sense of humor when I'm feeling low and down. Yeah, when I come to you, when the sun goes down. You take away my troubles, you take away my grief, you take away my heartache, like a night, in the night like a thief. You give me love, 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 crazy love. You give me love, 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 crazy love. Yes, I need you in the daytime. Yes, I need you in the night. Yes, I want to throw my arms around you. And kiss and hug you, kiss and hug you tight. Can you all sing this last <laughs> verse with me? You give me love, 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 crazy love. You give me love, 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 crazy love. All right. As y'all, who, if you're watching this for the first time, this is not karaoke church. Um, God put it on my heart to sing her that song during my, our wedding. And, um, and God put it on my heart again to, to make it up. And I'm not a singer, as you heard, but I do love my wife. And one thing that God has shown me as a husband, um, guys, take notes. Um, be willing to make a fool of yourself for the one you love. Because Jesus made a fool of himself for us. He sacrificed his life. He was mocked. He was persecuted. And as he has done, we can do as well as men laying down our lives, our pride for our wives. Right, the, so the Apostle Paul famously penned in 1 Corinthians 9.22 that he has become all things to all people. You all know that verse? Yeah. The Apostle Paul, a lot of us consider him the, probably the greatest apostle of them all. 
And I can tell you, it wasn't because of his eloquent speech, his intellect, or his knowledge, or his experience. Although he had an overflowing abundance of all those things, we admire him because of his complete submission, allowing God to transform him from the inside out. And a man who passionately obeyed the law before Christ and, and pursued God wholeheartedly, not understanding the law was done with. Paul went from a man that was who was a persecutor and a murderer of Christians to a man who saved the lost and advanced the kingdom of heaven. From a man who was puffed up with pride because of his own profound knowledge of scripture, of law, to a man who rejoiced in his weakness and then freely imparted the wisdom of God. Paul's nature was transformed from being a self-righteous, legalistic, prideful, merciless, religious man to a kind, tender-hearted, powerful, humble, mercy-filled, relationship-driven man, just like his Savior. When the revelation of who Jesus was knocked him off his feet and made him blind, it was the goodness of God that opened his blind eyes. It wasn't anything Paul did. The goodness of God opened his blind eyes. Some may look at the life of Paul pre-Christ and wonder, why the heck did God choose a Christian persecutor, a murderer, a man who stood stood so firm on the law that he believed God called him to kill. Why? A lot of us will wonder that. But, okay, so 1 Samuel 16, 7. This is a famous verse where, where the prophet Samuel is looking for the next king. And I'm, getting, I'm going somewhere with this. It says, Do not consider this his appearance or his height, or he, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things like, like people look at. People look at the outward appearance, and the Lord looks at the heart. That, to me, gave me the answer of why God chose Paul. A man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. A man that so many look at and says, now that is who I would like to be like. Paul, before he was Paul, he was a man named Saul, and he was a terrorist of Christians, mercilessly hunted us down killed, and murdered. But he did it all in the name of God. Why would God reward a man such as this? Good question, right? Y'all ever wonder that? When I was first saved, I read this and I went, why the, why the heck did God choose him? And God said, Jonathan looked at his heart. How many of you are thankful that God looks at our hearts instead of our actions? How many of us has done, have done the wrong things thinking it was for God and realizing just later that it was a mistake? Thank God God looks at our heart. I propose that all the dumb decisions that Paul made that he did because he loved God and because of his heart position towards serving God, God chose him. That gives me hope. I have never murdered anybody. And God can use him. God can surely use me and you. He was a ruthless mercenary. But God saw a man that wasn't a ruthless mercenary, but a man that was sold out to do his will. A guy that God knew if he opened his blind eyes, he will continue to do as well with new, with a new passion and a new target. He knew that Paul would repent from his, from his religious ways. He would lay down his knowledge, which puffed him up, crucify his own pride, and become one of the most obedient servants ever. God rewarded him 
for his heart and his passion to pursue the things that God had. And that leads me to the title of today's sermon. Last week I taught him Kingdom Culture. And as soon as we finished and I sat down, the next morning I'm driving to work, God said, continue to keep teach on kingdom things. And I said, I said, well, what do you want to teach on? And God said, teach on kingdom nature. So throughout history, when a kingdom is overthrown, the new king destroys the old empire. He destroys things that may become a stronghold. To him, setting, setting forth his new kingdom, establishing new ways, new customs, new traditions in his nature. God told me that a kingdom reflects the nature of its king. So if we are to have kingdom nature, should not our lives reflect the king we serve? Amen. Amen. I have seen ministries build their ministries on false understandings of God's nature. Like for instance, you know, if a person first was first <coughs> introduced to God as a harsh, legalistic God, their ministry tends to be harsh and legalistic. If their ministry was goes a complete opposite way, and people are afraid of the word hyper grace. Well, if they permit sin and say, regardless of what you do, God, God receives you into heaven, that's the ministry they have. And then there's the God of mercy and grace. The God that we know is Jesus Christ, that doesn't freely let us sin, but comes so we can freely be forgiven. God told me that we first need to know the king intimately before we can start establishing his kingdom. There's an intimacy of knowing God before we can establish what he has. We need to personally know him. It's intimate. And, the, and God will always choose someone who intimately knows him to begin to pour out his kingdom and his ways and inject his nature into us. Our intimacy with the king unlocks the the his authority in our lives. It allows us to see personally into the hearts of our king. I kind of jumped around, so I'm trying to catch up to where I'm at. I propose that if we are to fully establish a king, kingdom culture in our lives and our ministries at work, we must personally become intimate with our king. And when we are intimate with our King, He'll impregnate us with His nature, allowing us to create an environment that nurtures and develops the King's nature. This um, just yesterday, I, or this week, I watched Lorena. She's pregnant. She's my sister-in-law. I watched her feverishly clean her house while we were there, because God put in her a nature of a mother. And I'm telling you, God also put in her the nature of our father. So how many of y'all have seen Black Panther? No one here. One person. <laughs> two. Two people. Okay. All right. So I love Marvel Comics. So the main character is a guy named T'Challa. He was a new king. And he took the throne because his father was murdered. While he was transforming into the Black Panther and taking on the throne... He had a vision when he spoke with his father. T'Challa grabs his father's hand, kneels down in honor and humility. And his father looks at his son and says, Stand up! You are a king. Today I'm telling you the same thing. Stand up! You are a king. Amen. How can God be a king of kings if there's no kings to reign on his behalf? Wow. Stand up! You are a king. Amen. You were, and then he continues and says, were you not prepared to be a king your entire life? Did you not, did you not train and study by my side? T'Challa says, I am not ready to live without you. The father replied, 
a man who, is not, who has not prepared his son for his own death has failed as a father. While we were at Bethel, that was one of the big things that they were talking about, the leaders of Vance. They went around impregnating people, they said, and, and didn't stay to father them. And they, they're starting this movement of saying, we're going to go back, we're going to father these people that we birthed, these movements that we birthed. We're going to feed them. We're going to nurture them. We're going to grow them up to become fathers. So when I, heard, when I saw this scene, I remember thinking to God, I said, wow, that's powerful. It must mean something, right? And God says, it does. Only a king can raise kings. We must first submit to a king to be raised into a king. We must first submit to a father to be raised into a father. How do we learn to reign? Why are so many children forfeiting their nature of God and adopting the nature of man. You see that. You see kids adopting their parents' nature and doing the same mistakes. But I'm telling you, we have a new nature. And it's crazy. When God said only a king can, can raise kings, I thought, OMG. <laughs> Jesus Christ lived the perfect life. He modeled the power, miracles, signs, and wonders possible for all of us. He revealed the miraculous power and authority to the pa tender patience of a father. One of the greatest fathers I know is, is Chris Carricker. I watch how tender and patient he is with his son. I remember looking at that going, man, if my dad was an ounce of that with me, how much more would I have accomplished for this kingdom? It's beautiful when you see a father and son, a father big and powerful, willing to, to yield his power, love, and tenderness. Before Christ, I encountered many, many Christians, none of which revealed the nature of the father. All of them told me I was going to hell and I needed to repent. None of them revealed the goodness of God. However, the first characteristic I met God when I was about to commit suicide and God knocked on my door was his love, his goodness, his passion, and his tenderness. That's the God I know. And that's the God we as a church would like to represent. The first identity that God called me was a little boy. I remember I teared up and cried when he said, there's a little boy in this house. Y'all know my testimony. There's a little boy in this house who has questions and answers. Go tell him that the answers are only in the Holy Bible. And I remember thinking, I said to the people that knocked on my door, who is in my house? I, I'm crying. And they said, a little boy. And they're looking behind me for a little boy. And I teared up and I said, I am that little boy. I was 23. I am that little boy. You heard the voice of God and I am that little boy he's talking about. And God's looking at each of you, little boy, little girl, not out of, not out of uh, lording over you, but out of love. Mm -hmm. Little girl, I love you. You're my daughter. You're precious. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And God's nature is good. His goodness has endured forever. His goodness has filled our hearts. His goodness has renewed our minds. His goodness has covered the earth. His goodness has manifested through the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And His goodness lives in you. Amen. God's many things. And here's a few that I look at. And, I'm, and because he, he is and was, we can too. God is a Father. God is a Son, the Holy Spirit, the Word, a brother, a friend, faithful. The sacrifice our Savior, a priest, a bridegroom, a provider, a protector, our lover, the teacher, our mediator, our vindicator, the healer, the shepherd, the light of the world, the potter, the creator, the bread of life, speaker of life, holy, righteous, our comforter, our advocate, our intercessor, our counselor, our strengthener, and our rewarder few aspects of God's nature. When I needed a Savior, He revealed Himself as Jesus Christ and saved me. 
When I was lost, he revealed himself as a shepherd and led me. When I was hungry and thirsty, again, he became the bread of life and the well of living water. So I hunger no more when I seek him and I thirst no more. God is not angry or disappointed in you. No matter what decisions you made in your life, he is not angry or disappointed in you. God is love. He is in a good mood. He overflows with goodness. He is loyal to you. He is compassionate to you. He is powerful. He loves passionately. He does all things out of goodness, out of the goodness of his heart. That includes correcting, but directing as well. And even manifesting all out of the goodness of his heart. His nature reveals, was revealed perfectly through Jesus Christ. The Son, and also the Father. The protector and a friend. Jesus came to reveal the Father, to, to free our eyes of religion, to lift that veil of religion off of us, to rip it, tear it to shreds. He came to eradicate the old covenant and establish the new. He fulfilled it. And in that fulfillment, the old covenant was eradicated. As I mentioned before, God revealed to me that a kingdom, the old covenant kingdom, has to be fulfilled and taken down for a, for a new kingdom to be established. God is love, therefore, in, therefore, as a new creation, we are vessels to, re to receive and disperse His love. God can pour you out wherever He wants. You're the sweet incense that God pours into a room. Where there is death, God brings in roses, jasmine, lavender, and brings life. We must forsake any part of our nature that conflicts with His nature. That means turn away, put to rest, bury it. Personalities, nature, we must look at that and say, that is not the nature of God, therefore, mm -hmm. it is not part of me. Amen. I am made in his image. Mm -hmm. Harsh is not a part of me. God is not harsh. Mm -hmm. I do not tear people down. God, lit, God built people up. Amen. Those are the things God's talking about. I know I haven't mentioned a scripture, so I'm going to read some scripture. <laughs> um, Holy Spirit, search us, help us do this. So I'm going to read in John, 1 John 4, 7 through 11. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. And I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Those who are loved by God, let his love continually pour from you to one another because God is love. Everyone who loves his Father by God and experiences an intimate knowledge of him. The one who doesn't love has yet to know God. For God is love. The light of, of God's love shined within us when he sent his matchless son into the world so that we might live through him. This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love, not ours. He provided it by sending his son to be pleasing, sacrificial offering to take away our sins. Delightful Delightfully loved ones, if he loved us with such tremendous love, then loving one another should be our way of life. Amen. There are a lot of people who are who stand against love and grace preachers. Hey, if I'm a love and grace preacher, so be it. Because he's love. How can you how can you serve a God of love and not preach love? Love and grace is its nature. And the very moment your heart said yes, it became yours. You had access to it. The same level he has. You have access to the same level, to love at the same level, to forgive at the same level, to have mercy at the same level, to give grace at the same level. To attack 
sickness at the same level. Yeah. Olivia recently said, when I was at my worst, Olivia's my wife, when I was at my worst and expected God to strike me down, I realized I could not run his love. Amen. She couldn't, neither can you. Neither can I. First Corinthians 13, y'all know those that, that chapter really well, and I'm going to read a little more scripture to make this, make this legal. Um, so I'm going to read through 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, again in the Passion Translation. This is a little longer one, so bear with me. If I were to speak with elo eloquence in earth's many languages and the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I did not express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging symbol. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden, hidden secrets, and if I possessed unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that I could move mountains, but I never learned to love, then I have nothing. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I owned to feed the poor and to offer my body to be a burnt to be burned as a martyr without pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflates its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easy, irritated, or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best of others. Love never takes failure, failure to defeat, for it never gives up. I was going to read that again. Love never takes failure to defeat, for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. It extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades away. It is more enduring than, the, than, the, than tongues, which will one day still be silent. Love remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. Our present knowledge and our prophecies are but partial. But when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. When I was a child, I spoke about childish matters, for I saw things like a child and reason like a child. But the day came when I matured and I set aside my childish ways. For now, we see but a faint reflection of riddles and mysteries through the reflections in the mirror. But one day, we will see face to face. My understanding is incomplete now, but one day I will understand everything just as everything about me has been fully understood. Until then, there are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. Yet love surpasses all them all. For above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. We're all ambassadors of God. And as an ambassador, you carry his full authority and weight. You carry the ability to bring call to life the dreams that have died. Speak life into people's hearts as you see them. Not as you see them in a the natural, but as God shows you who they really are. Call that out. We're citizens of heaven, not citizens here. We're just visiting. We're just visiting this planet. We're citizens of heaven. And therefore, we must live according to the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. We must portray God's nature. Mm -hmm. Through Christ, our new nature is patient, kind, gentle. It doesn't traffic in shame or disrespect. It's not easy, easily irritated. Our nature is now joyful and celebrates honesty. We find no delight in what, what is wrong. We're a safe place of shelter. Our nature never stops believing the best of others. Our nature never takes failure as defeat, never gives up, 
and never stops loving. That's the nature we live in. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's the God we serve. Now you wonder why God would empower us so much power mm -hmm. and authority. One, He loves us. Two, He trusts you. He believes in you. He believes in you, Patrick. He ain't done with you yet. He believes in you. He's giving you so much authority to not build, not only build kingdoms, you can call them forth. You can walk into, you can walk into a foreign country and say, the kingdom of God is at hand and it will be. Because you're a carrier of that. Y'all are a carrier of that. From this day forth, Mark 1, 15, this is a Mark 1, 15 season for us as I'm speaking this out. The kingdom of God is and will be at hand wherever you go. Amen. You are an ambassador. Created to love. Created to impart and disperse gifts, joy, peace, grace, Mercy at the level Christ did it, and He has called you to greater things. Let's call forth those kingdoms, let's establish new kingdoms, let's show the world what a nature of a Christian looks like. Because you, as an ambassador, you represent God. Well, thank you for joining us today. God bless you all. If you all are, are interested in crawfish, we'll be boiling soon. Um, we love you all. Thanks for joining. <laughs>